2 Kings 23, verse 1 through 7. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place <clears throat> of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping his commands, laws, decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Then the king instructed Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second rank, and the, te ke oh, excuse me, the temple gatekeepers, to remove from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal. Asherah and all the powers of the heavens. The king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem on the terraces of the Kidron Valley and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priest who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah for they had offered sacrifices to the pagan shrines throughout Judah and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. He had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun, the moon, the constellations, and all the powers of the heavens. The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley where he burned it. Then he ground the ashes of the pole to dust and threw the dust over the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord, where the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Josiah was eight years old when he became king of Judah. It was the southern kingdom just below Israel in a divided monarchy. He took the throne in tenuous times, full of great anxiety. The Assyrian Empire, the world superpower of the day, who had just taken the nation of Israel off into exile, the Assyrians were crumbling, and therefore leaving a massive geopolitical vacuum in the day, and there was great fear over who would fill it. These were tenuous, anxious times for Judah. And the country was in the hands of an eight-year-old who was either wise beyond his years or was surrounded by people who led him in the right ways. Unlike his father and his grandfather before him, Josiah had a heart for the ways of God. And so he set about to renovate the temple in Jerusalem, which had long been neglected. One day, one of the construction workers, who was also a priest, of course, was cleaning out the janitor's closet. And there in the janitor's closet, over in the corner, just beside the old rusty sink that no longer worked, and the, the old wrenches in the corner, he found a scroll. He blew the dust off and coughed a couple of times and knocked the cobwebs off the scroll, and he unrolled it and began reading. And after he read it, he rolled the scroll up and sprinted to the palace. And he sprinted into the king's room and he said to Josiah, you, you've got to read this. And Josiah read the scroll and ripped his garments, the Bible says. And he fell on his knees. And that old book, which had been collecting dust in the corner of the janitor's closet in the temple, initiated a new day in the history of Judah. Most scholars today believe the scroll that was found in the temple that day 
was either in part or in whole what we have as the book of Deuteronomy in our Bibles. The word Deuteronomy means second law, and it functioned that way for the people of, of Judah and for Josiah. Essentially, the book of Deuteronomy reminds people of the centrality of the covenant that they had made with God. It reminds them that they are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. You might remember when Jesus says that in the Gospels, He's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, the great commandment. And they are to remember the Lord. Not to forget, but to remember the Lord. Because they only believed in one God, they could be wholly devoted to the one God, deeply committed to this one God. Unlike all the other pagans that surrounded them, they didn't have to balance their multiple devotions. They just had to rightly direct their singular devotion. And so the book of Deuteronomy essentially says to the people of Judah, remember the covenant. Love God with all that you are. Do right by your neighbor. Remember, lest you forget. His name was... Henry Gustave Molaison. And they said he had the most important brain in all the world. He was born in 1926 near Hartford, Connecticut, and for all intents and purposes had a normal childhood. That is, until the time when he was about 10 years old and he had a severe bike accident and he hit his head on the ground and he began having seizures which became more and more severe with age and more and more prohibitive for anything that resembled a normal life. And so, in the 1950s, a doctor decided to do what in those days was a very risky and rather experimental surgery. On August 26, 1953, doctors with pretty rudimentary tools removed a good part of Molaison's brain including the part that we now know deals with memory. While the procedure relieved the seizures and gave Molaison an, a normal life, visibly, it really harmed his memory. He couldn't remember anything. He couldn't remember anything over a 60-second span. He couldn't remember his way to the restroom. He couldn't remember when he had eaten last. Everyone he met, it was as if he was meeting them for the very first time. Even his oldest and best friends, it was as if he had never met them. He could not remember who his parents were. And every time he was informed that his parents had passed away, the grief and the pain was so raw, it was as if it was the first time he was ever hearing it. His brain, therefore, became one of the most important brains for neuroscientists to study. Everything else was working well, it was just the memory. His biography, which was written by his attending neuroscientist, was entitled, Permanent Present Tense. Permanent Present Tense. Because Molaison was sort of trapped in the present tense. He struggled to know who he was. You know, one of the ways we remind ourselves who we are as people is we remember. We remember our stories. We remember our journey. He couldn't have real friends because a huge part of friendship is the shared journey we have together. He couldn't make sense of life because memory is essential in the way we construct our notions of reality. In each of these ways, they discovered that amnesia is a sort of dehumanization. Because memory is part and parcel to what it means to be a human being. They ran the scroll to Josiah. He opened it up and he read, Remember the Lord! And he tore his robe because he knew he was leading a group of people who had forgotten. It was a trajectory that had been set long before he got there. In fact, it started when Solomon was king. Solomon is the first king mentioned in the book of 1 Kings. Josiah is pretty much the last king in the book of 2 Kings. And so, their book ends in the story of all the kings of Judah. Some scholars think they're meant to be read together. Solomon and his grandeur as a king. I'm sure you've heard about it. Solomon who's famous for building the grand temple, one of the wonders of the ancient world. 
And yet all the while Solomon was building the temple, he was running after the ways of the world. He's also famous, you'll remember, for his many wives. He didn't have many wives because he was girl crazy. He had wives because he wanted to have uh, political negotiations and treaties with all the neighbors. Hey, start talking about wives and I knock the microphone off. He was walking in the ways of the world. He thought the way you have power as a nation is, you know, the way everybody else has power. You might even remember that one of, of Solomon's wives was Pharaoh's daughter. And shortly after he married Pharaoh's daughter, Solomon enslaved some of the people who had been captured in war and used their labor to build some of his projects in Jerusalem, including the temple. Can you imagine how that must have felt to the Jewish people for the king of Judah to have married Pharaoh's daughter? And now he's using slave labor to build Jerusalem. Does that not feel like a total reversal of the Exodus story? Which was their story. Except now they're doing the opposite. They are Egypt now. Solomon destroyed all those who opposed his reign. He taxed those who had little to give to the point that they revolted against him. And while Solomon, by the metrics of this world, was a grand success bringing money and goods and peace to Israel, the Bible says at the time of his death that the Lord was angry with him because he turned his heart away from God. Solomon forgot the Lord. And then there's Josiah of whom we know nothing of his successes or his failures as a king. We know nothing about the national debt or the GDP or the unemployment rate. What we do know about Josiah is that when he read the scroll, he tore his clothes and he sat in ashes and he set out to remind the people who they were. He called a solemn assembly of the elders and they reclaimed their commitment to God and God alone. He began to purge Israel of all the altars to all the other gods that had populated their places of worship all throughout the kingdom. And for the first time since the days of the judges, Josiah reinstituted the Passover. They had forgotten the Passover. And Josiah said, let's remember the story of when God liberated us. God is the God who liberates slaves, not the God who makes them. God is the God of the oppressed. And the people remembered this God. The God of the last and the least and the lost. And for the first time in their lifetimes, the people of Judah remembered the Lord. And it all began when some priest stumbled in a janitor's closet in the temple and discovered a scroll that hadn't been read for quite some time. We are in a series on the Bible and recovering Scripture in the life of the church. Today, we inhabit a world that's something akin to the one inherited by Josiah when he was eight years old. Anxiety, confusion. The fruits of our age are cynicism and mockery, lies and power, anger and apathy, despair and division, and sometimes outright abuse. How do we move forward in such a world? How does our faith impact the public arena. Might I propose to you that one of the reasons we don't know how to move forward into this world is because we have a bad case of amnesia. Might I suggest to you today that the church is in a sort of permanent present tense in which we can't see past the shock of the moment because we've forsaken the wisdom of the ages. Call me crazy. But if the church moves forward into this world, I think it will be because we remember our way forward. Henry David Thoreau, the great poet, once wrote about the New Testament. Most people favor it outwardly, defend it with bigotry, and hardly ever actually read it. He might as well have said there's a scroll collecting dust in the janitor's closet of the church. Who will dig it out? Who will dare read it and do it? 
If we did, we might just accidentally remember who we are. We might just remember what we're about. We might just remember how to be peacemakers in a world that is tattered and torn with division. And people who don't understand each other largely because they don't want to. We might also remember that shalom, the Hebrew word for peace, isn't just the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice and fairness and equality for all people. The Bible would say to us, if you want peace, seek justice. We might remember that we are called to be people who seek the truth and tell the truth at all times and in all ways, and not just when it agrees with our positions. We are not the people to whom the truth belongs, brothers and sisters. We are the people who belong to the truth. We might remember the reality that we will never be able to redeem anyone with whom we are unwilling to eat. Which is why if we believe in a kingdom that is, as, is expansive and has something to do with all people, our tables should be expansive and have something to do with all people as well. We might remember that we are called to the sort of lives that break patterns of despair, cycles of despair in our culture, cycles of violence, where you hit me and I hit you back because I feel justified. And it perpetuates the cycle of violence. Who would dare step into that and break it? Cycles of poverty, which some people say is violence in slow motion. Cycles of injustice, in which hurt people hurt people. Who would transform their pain instead of just transmitting it? What this means is that the world needs people who will stick their neck in there or to stretch their arms out there. The cross is how the world is transformed, is it not? Because love that's willing to sacrifice is the only way the world is really transformed. But who would do such a thing? We might just remember if we knock the dust off our Bibles that each of us and all of us are connected. Connected to the God who created us, to the earth from whence we came, and to all of God's other creatures in this world. Which is to say that any effort to subject the common good to personal gain is an assault on the way God created things. Y'all, when following Jesus becomes synonymous with following the money, we have forsaken our way as the people of God. This is to say that we are all interconnected and we belong to each other. From the kindergartner in Little Rock who lost his elementary school this week, to the veteran at the VA hospital who gave more to his country than his country was willing to give back, to the senior adult in the nursing home who has never visited, not once, to the CEO who has everything to live on and nothing to live for. We are all interconnected. And it is difficult to tell where your life starts and stops and my life starts and stops and people who share this city with us where their lives start and stop. We are all intertwined, male and female, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, Republican and Democrat, liberal and conservative. We are all one and we belong to each other. And we will never be who we're supposed to be until we realize that. If we dusted off our Bibles, we might remember a hope that can pierce through any amount of cynicism and despair. Hope is with us because God is with us. We might remember that in the strange world of the Bible, humility is a virtue and pride is a vice. Because ignorance more frequently begets confidence than knowledge does. Might I also remind you of the words of St. Augustine when he said, when we fight evil in the world, we should never do so as if it rose entirely outside of ourselves. We should live in the world as humble people. The Bible says that's the way to life and goodness. We might find that we tend to look at power in a totally different way. Recognizing that those in power are responsible to a higher power still. And those who have no power have a God who stands with them in solidarity. 
Which is why in a culture that likes to point out the irresponsibility of those at the bottom of the social ladder, we might actually be the people who point out the irresponsibility of those at the top. For our God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. We might remember our need to repent of our other allegiances, of the gods who go by many names, which dilute the good news and divert our attention and distort our values and refocus our eyes on the one whom we are commanded to love with all that we are. We might remember that loving God and loving our neighbor are intimately intertwined. Which is why when Jesus was asked to quote the greatest commandment, He quoted two. We might just remember our ways forward, brothers and sisters. And I don't just mean in the Solomon way, where you rebuild the temple and its religious theatrics and its civil religion, the sort of stuff that impacts how a thing looks. I'm talking the Josiah way, where we open the scroll and bring our lives to it and tear our garments and change our lives and remember who we are, the sort of religion that impacts what a thing is. We will remember, lest we forget. And in remembering, we will become more and more of what we are. In the foreword of Brooks Hayes' autobiography, Politics is My Parish, Rabbi Arthur Schlesinger, who was an old friend of Hayes, writes these words about him. And I quote, listen to these words. Brooks Hayes was born in Arkansas during the administration of William McKinley. As a small boy, he heard William Jennings Bryan in full oratorical flood. He was a fascinated youth in the Senate gallery during the final debate on the Versailles Treaty. He fought the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s and stood in the anxious crowd at Franklin Roosevelt's first inauguration. He was a frontline soldier in the New Deal's fight against rural poverty and therefore served eight terms in Congress until he was defeated because he believed black children should be permitted to exercise their constitutional right to attend public schools in Little Rock. President Eisenhower made him a director of the Tennessee Valley Authority and President Kennedy made him first an Assistant Secretary of State and then a Special Assistant in the White House. He has been President of the Southern Baptist Convention, an office rarely yielded to a layman. When one Baptist minister objected, we don't want a politician for President, do we? Another replied, well, Brooks ain't enough of one to count. Or so Brooks likes to tell the story. He is a founder of that useful organization, former members of Congress, visiting professor in fortunate colleges across the land, philosopher at large, and one of the best loved men in America. He loves nearly everyone back, including on the testimony of this book, such unpromising objects as Orville Faubus and Richard M. Nixon. But his love, like his hope, is realistic and not sentimental. His personal development was shaped too by profound religious commitment. For a time he considered entering the ministry. Finally, he was persuaded that public life, if accompanied by dedication, could be as significant in a religious sense as pastoral service. The Southern Baptist Church of his youth seemed to him preoccupied with sterile theological quibbles. The human plight of poor whites and poor blacks did not trouble the white Christian conscience. But for Brooks Hayes, Christianity was a call to duty. It was judgment as well as consolation. His life has been a quest to find ways of relating religion and politics without violating the constitutional separation of church and state. For Hayes, both religion and politics enjoin a mission to the poor and powerless in society. In fact, when they crossed paths in the White House one day, Martin Luther King Jr. said about Hayes, he has suffered with us. Unquote. For Brooks Hayes, our faith was not personal therapy. It wasn't towing partisan lines. It was not the truth of power, but the power of truth. It wasn't what was expedient in the moment, but what was eternally good and beautiful and true. 
Faith was both personal and public. And salvation had to do with the soul and the society. Our calling, he would remind us, is not to go to heaven when we die, but to bring heaven to earth and how we live. Now where in the world do you think Brooks Hayes got those crazy ideas? Where did his very public work find its roots which sustained it over the course of decades when the going was tough? What sustained him? I hate to speak for one who is gone from us, but I think I'm on safe ground to say that if he were here today, he would say that somewhere along the way, maybe even in this very church, someone found a scroll in the corner and knocked the dust off and cleared the cobwebs off and actually opened it up and read it. Brothers and sisters, we have work to do. Boy, do we all, each and every, have work to do. The world is calling us forward. But if we move forward into this crazy world, it will be because we found our Bibles, blew the dust off, and actually read them. If we move forward in this world, it will be because we remember our way forward. The future belongs to the dreamers, yes, and the doers, no doubt. But the future also belongs to people who will remember. And we will remember, won't we? We will remember lest we forget. Never, ever. No, never. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we have come today to remember who and whose we are. To remember the story of this church and the church. And the Lord of the church. As we move forward into this world without all the answers, help us to remember. And go in faith and hope and love, that you will continue to be who you have always been. We pray this in Jesus' name, the Eternal One. Amen.